Well, good morning and welcome this morning to Tri-City Baptist Church. It's good to see those of you who are able to make it out. We knew some weather was coming. We didn't know exactly, you know, how much was going to come and what the impact would be. But we do praise the Lord uh, that you have arrived safely. Pray for those who may be out on the road at this time. I know we have some family traveling today. We've had some members from the church who tried to get here this morning and just were not able to either due to other accidents and, and just things going on. So we just thank the Lord for his goodness and his grace and his mercy that we're able to be here. And uh, we especially appreciate our AV team who at this time is able to provide the service online. So for those of you who are online, welcome. Thank you for being with us. I believe our numbers will be up probably on Zoom this morning. And uh, we just thank the Lord for these opportunities that we have especially to come together. Out in the lobby this morning, uh, Pastor has a number of uh, his commentaries available at this point. You can see First and Second Chronicles and Job are now available in the lobby. And you can just see Karen Price. She's at a table just off to the left, my left, your right, as you go out those main doors uh, in the lobby. And then this coming Saturday, the Ruta Teens have an activity uh, diamond smuggling. I don't know what that's all about, but since I need diamonds, maybe I'm coming. Find out what that smuggling is all about. But uh, if uh, you know of any teens that may not be aware of this, but would uh, like to be a part of this activity, please reach out to Pastor Nathan Stedman and he can share all those details. They'd love to have all the teens that they can to participate. So parents, please reach out to them. Uh, grief share for those who are interested in attending a grief share series. Uh, this is typically for those who have suffered a significant loss in the family. We had a blessing yesterday, a good turnout of a number of folks who were in a session on a loss of a spouse that was well attended next Sunday morning on uh, March the 13th at 9 a.m. during the ABF hour and pastor study. Uh, Pastor Larry will be leading a grief share series. I believe that series is about 13 weeks long or so. If you uh, have not had opportunity to sign up but would like to participate, we have a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. If there's anyone who's online, you just couldn't be here today, but do intend to sign up, you can call the office and, and we'll get you registered as well. Uh, we've been very excited to reinstitute the Lord's Supper on a more regular uh, basis. We're trying to do it monthly. It may not happen every month, and we alternate between uh, the a.m. service and the p.m. service. So next Sunday evening, uh, March the 13th, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper. We look forward to that time of fellowship. As many of you know, we have a very special conference coming up at the end of the month. I'll ask Dr. Bulkley to come up, say a few words about the Freedom That Last conference. Thank you, Skip. Appreciate it. I want to just uh, mention to you that we encourage you to register. And uh, one of the reasons is this is uh, the first counseling conference that we have had here. And we're uh, encouraging people to come for that conference. If you've not registered, please do. Stop back at the table that's in the foyer and register for that. Just quickly let you know about some of the uh, topics. Uh, Dr. Jim Berg is gonna be uh, teaching on unmasking addiction, explaining what it is and how it's taking over many people's lives. Uh, Dr. Kevin Hurt will be teaching on counseling men who struggle with sexual addictions and then Jim Berg will be teaching again, helping others to grow out of addiction. So if you know someone who has had trouble with substance abuse or any number of addictions, we're gonna be talking about a variety of them as well. That's Friday that we're gonna be doing that. And then on, and that one, by the way, that starts at two o'clock in the afternoon. On Saturday, we're gonna be talking about the fact, well, Friday night, Kevin Hurt's gonna be talking about counseling marriages devastated by sexual addictions. Saturday, Dr. Jim Berg will be teaching a model for counseling addiction sufferers. As a ministry that has, he has developed with that, I think it's going to be very helpful. And then we're going to be talking about seven practical guidelines to use when counseling addicts, Dr. Kevin Hurt again. And then we find that uh, we're going to have, we're going to hear from someone that we're all familiar with, and that is our pastor, 
who is going to be sharing on Saturday morning. Um, it's going to be talking about his own testimony of how God has freed him in many ways when, from what he was before he came to Christ. And it's a, it's a wonderful testimony. I love hearing pastors' stories. It's a beautiful thing. We'll be talking about the multiplicity of addictions. There's so many different types. And so we just encourage you to come. We have some more sessions on Sunday, uh, Combined Adult Bible Fellowship, where we'll have a, a panel discussion and with questions and all that you might want to bring. And then uh, Sunday morning, Dr. Kevin Hurt will be teaching Learning to Counsel with Confidence. Doesn't mean that you have to be a counselor to come. It's just an opportunity because the truth is, if you're dealing with people, you're going to counsel at one point or another, just in general, just over the coffee cup, you're going to be counseling. So I hope you'll come with that, learning to counsel with confidence. And uh, Jim Berg will finish up. These are 11 sessions that are going on during this time. And I hope that you'll come and be part of that. Helping others to face trials through the lens of James chapter one is from Jim Berg, who finish up the counseling conference. So please sign up for that. You can register online, or you can register out in a foyer, but we hope that you'll take advantage of that. And let's make it a very good turnout for this first conference. God bless you. Thank you so much. So let me just, uh, one piece of business, and this is mostly for the choir and the orchestra due to the weather today, uh, choir and orchestra has been canceled. So if you are online and we're planning to attend that this afternoon, that has been canceled. So do take note of that. We are especially excited when we come to this time of the service as we're reminded of our missionaries who we want to continue to keep in our prayers at all time, who are out uh, in various areas of the world, ministering in a variety of ways. Uh, this week, Todd and Sarah Hudson serving in Austria. And so let me share with you uh, three of their praises, and then we'll go to some prayer requests. Uh, blessing is that they're now able to have a Spanish church meeting, in addition to German and English. All three churches have made progress in becoming self-sustaining ministries. We see the Lord blessing there and that their facilities will accommodate all three ministries without any issues. We do need to pray for our missionaries and the various um, facilities that they have. We are so truly blessed here. We have a lot of room. We can accommodate a lot of simultaneous ministries. Some areas are not as able. So do pray for them that the Lord continues uh, to work with each of these ministries uh, that um, that they'll continue to bless and, and, and have uh, what they need. You can see the second prayer request here is for unity in these three churches. Uh, the first one, they have some folks who are looking towards ordination. Let's pray to that. We, we always are asking the Lord to send laborers out into the field, and we are especially praying that the Lord would call folks into ministry. So pray for those studying for ordination. And then finally, for those who have continued to avoid meetings, that they would start attending again. And just like us, uh, countries around the world are facing the aspects of COVID. They're in different timelines. And so pray that these folks would be able to come back together. Well, thank you, Pastor Hunter. We'll pray here and start our service. If you're visiting, welcome. We're thrilled to have you uh, weathering the storm coming up. Please uh, be careful as you head home. Uh, I did see Ethan Dorsling earlier. So Ethan, good to have you back. He's here for spring break. Uh, he's a student in uh, Ohio at Cedarville. We'll be with us for a couple of days. And then I saw Fran, where is Fran? Or Senator Fran. Hey, Fran, good to have you from Virginia now with us uh, this morning. And um, Mrs. Von Deeston, you have someone with you. Great to have, I think, a son. Yeah, great to have you. You're all smiles. Yeah, it's hard to miss, miss that. Always good to have a son with you in, in a service when he's in the area. And any other guests, thank you for joining us here on this Lord's Day. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the beautiful snow outside. And um, for some of us, we really do love snow. And we... Um, Thank you for these beautiful mountains that we can look unto and be reminded that you're the creator of them and of all things, and that you're in control of all things. We're so thankful 
that uh, we don't have to second guess that, that you know what you're doing. Uh, you're never taken off guard. Uh, we don't have to second guess anything. And so Lord, help us to have childlike faith, trusting you and to walk with you. We uh, thank you for those who are able to get out today and uh, we pray you bless our fellowship here. For those who are online, uh, locally and across the country, maybe world, that you would uh, allow the, our service to be an encouragement to them as well. And uh, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that you take scripture and you sanctify us through the preaching and teaching of it. And so, Lord, may we uh, be more like your son as a result of our gathering today. We pray for our country. We pray for our country's leaders at all levels, that we would have uh, people who are truly statesmen, who love you, love this country, and are making decisions based on eternal principles. Lord, have mercy upon us, our churches, our individuals here, that we would, uh, in the midst of these unique days, that we would uh, not flinch, that we would be strong, that we'd be steadfast, and always abounding in your work. Lord, we pray for the world. We think of the issues we're watching unfold in, in the Ukraine. And uh, we know that we could be very near to uh, not only a war in that region, but a, a war that would include many nations. And from a prophetic viewpoint, Lord, uh, you, you, know, you know the timeline. And uh, Lord, it seems that we're near. We're near to the coming of your son. And I pray that uh, we would take that serious, that this hope that we do have would have its purifying effect today on us, and that we look forward to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray now for the service be committed to you. Uh, may you use this time for your glory and for our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. and forgives in full, sets my guilty conscience free. When I face a hopeless grave, God in mercy rescued me. He has paid redemption's price on the cross of The Lord, O oh my soul, with singing, let his praises adorn this place. Bless the Lord for his tender mercies. Let me never forget his grace. gives endless mercy pouring down then i know his steadfast love rest upon me like a crown bless the lord O oh my soul with singing let his praises adorn this place bless the lord for his time let me never forget his grace. Bless the Lord, O oh my 
song is singing. Let his praises adorn his place. Bless the Lord for his tender mercies. Let me never forget his grace. Bless the Lord for his tender mercies. Let, let me never forget his grace. Welcome this morning. We're going to begin our singing in just a moment. I uh, mentioned that the Richards were on their way in. We miss having them lead the music here uh, for sure. Miss them today. We're glad you're here. They're on their way down from their home down uh, southwest of Morrison. And as they got closer to town, the snow got worse and worse and almost got hit. And then somebody cut them off. Then there's some accidents. He turned around and went home. So I found out on my way in this morning that I get to, to uh, substitute. So we're going to have a great time together uplifting the Lord with our singing and praising, and we're glad you're here. For those of you on Zoom, welcome. I hope you'll be able to join us in worship today. We're going to be, begin by singing hymn number two. Number two, come Christians, join to sing. Let's stand together as we sing now. Number two. singing. You may be seated. We'll continue singing with uh, hymn number 365. This is a change from your bulletins. Number 365, There is a Redeemer. We'll sing this together. All three stanzas.
We're going to have our orchestra members join us in the choir piece again today. Uh, this choir piece fits very well with a passage that many of you are familiar with in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not not of yourselves. So it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The simplicity of the gospel is so beautiful, and it's not anything we can do to earn our salvation at all. But it's all finished on the cross of Jesus Christ. His finished work there provides for us salvation, grace alone. Thank you, choir. Appreciate that this morning in grace alone. We'll continue our singing now and remain seated while we sing together. Number 661, 661. Oh, church, arise. We'll sing the first three stanzas together. Number 661.
Turn back now to hymn number, the right page here. There we go. Number 35. Hymn number 35, we'll stand together as we sing now, Worship the Lord. Sing to the Savior a song of praise. job singing today. Even with our limited number, you did a great job. Wonderful singing. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Larry. Uh, Larry, Larry is our utility player. He can do anything. And I uh, appreciate you leading the music this morning. Uh, yesterday, Larry sang two songs in uh, Art Cinnamon's funeral. Uh, they were really beautiful. Well done. And also, a uh, Pastor Nathan, as always, did a great job with his exhortation and invitation to, to come to know the Lord. So we had, I thought, a, a beautiful service. Um, it's, it's really, it's always difficult to lose a loved one. Um, very hard. Uh, leaves enormous voids in our hearts and lives. And yet for those uh, loved ones that know the Lord and uh, we know they're with him, that makes all the difference. And uh, our Zimmerman is with the Lord here day number 12 in heaven. And um, he's enjoying God very much. Uh, our, our funeral services typically are, are really celebrations of lives. And they're encouraging. I, was, I went home refreshed yesterday, Deb. I, I was encouraged by the attendance, by the spirit, by the memories of art. And just uh, the whole service and reception was just really beautiful. So it was a, a, a blessed day, really. And thankful for that. Um, I know a number of you have lost loved ones recently in this past year, and it's, um, it's hard. It's very difficult. Um, it's good to see Jonathan Rash back. I know you just lost your mother. I'm sorry for that uh, loss. Um, uh, watched a little bit on Facebook, some of your posts there from California, and your family pictures, just beautiful. But uh, we're sorry for that loss and other losses I know that you, you as a church family have been going through. This morning, we will be in Second Kings. I won't mention much about the Russian invasion. We'll likely come back with some prophecy topics in um, upcoming weeks. If you did not hear last week's sermon, I do encourage you to go online and listen to that and pick up the notes. 
I think there are hard copy notes available for you for some who asked about it there in the, at the visitor center. Also last Sunday night, we took a, a number of questions regarding prophecy that I think was recorded as well. Um, I, I did you know, pretty strongly say if we're serious about um, slowing down the Russian invasion, you turn off the, the oil spigots immediately, immediately. And uh, I don't see that happening for any time. And that's, that, that's indicative of um, really where we stand as a leadership in our country, tells you, tells you a lot. <laughs> And it's not good. It's not good. And it's, it's more, I think, just my opinion, it's more than just a far left, you know, our, our leadership is tilting to the left side of the Democratic Party and in, 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 in playing with the, the Green New Deal folks. That may be part of it, but I don't think that's the main part. <laughs> uh, I think we have very compromised leadership uh, who've been involved with uh, other countries and they're so compromised that they can't do much of anything. So that's, that's just my humble opinion. Uh, but we do want to pray for anyone who's being oppressed. When, when another country comes in and invades unprovoked, that's not good. And um, you let that go and let it continue to go. Pretty soon they're on your doorstep. So you look out, you look out. But what a crazy world internationally. I, I think of Jerry and Amy this week. I noticed on a Facebook post, someone stole your truck, your trailer, your equipment. Makes me angry, <laughs> makes me angry. And, uh, and we had, we've had vehicles, our own church vehicle stolen. We've had our church trailer stolen. I mean, you've had issues. Uh, our neighborhood watch, I, I watch that each day and see how many houses have been broken into and how many you know, things going on. We're living in you know, interesting times. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter four that in the end times, he describes them as perilous days, perilous, dangerous violent type days and we're certainly there locally as well as internationally well things are no different than as they were in the day of the author of second Kings. some suggest it was jeremiah that wrote this um book second Kings. so if you'd like to turn there to the sixth chapter uh as i shared with my class this morning in the abf hour the uh this book was written at the time of the exile so what does that mean that means the northern kingdom of Israel has been destroyed by the Assyrians, early 700s BC, and it means that the southern part of Israel, Judah, has likewise been destroyed, as well as the temple, and the people are living as slaves in exile or captivity. So if you're an Israelite, this book here is written while you're away from home. Everything is lost. You lost your country. Uh, you lost your, your temple, your place of worship, you lost your trailer, you lost your tools, you, you lost your family. I um, mean, it's all gone. And you're wondering, how do I live when my life has been turned upside down? How can I be encouraged? And so 2 Kings has some very encouraging themes that help us to, to learn how to live uh, when our nation is dying. So... Uh, in this book, this story here is a fantastic story of the axe head. This is an iron axe head. You might not be able to see where you're sitting. See all the red on the end? This has probably been used for executing, cutting people's heads off. No, I actually painted it years ago. Uh, but it's heavy. This is an iron axe head. And we're going to talk about this story about how a, a, a seminary student was working on the new building and, and, and an axe head flew off the handle and went out into the Jordan River and obviously sunk to its bottom. And we're going to talk about the story, how that axe head was resurrected, raised, and how the axe head swam, floated. You say, are you kidding? You want me to believe that? It's not a very credible story. So uh, let's talk about that axe head. Let's talk about how would you interpret this? And so there's a number of approaches that people have, have suggested. Uh, some are, you know, uh, less than convincing. There are those who like to interpret the Bible allegorically. When their faith struggles in believing the story at face value, they want to go beyond it and allegorize it. Uh, we have friends who um, do not believe in a literal millennial reign of Christ. Uh, they're all millennialists. And so all those millennial passages, the way they have to handle it is they can't interpret the millennium literally, a literal thousand year reign. 
So what they seek to do is allegorize those passages. And there's a lot of those passages and their interpretations become quite fanciful at time and uh, often uh, humorous because they're not taking the objective, historic, literal, grammatical approach to this interpretation. They're now subjectively reading into it and trying to create a storyline. And it's more subjective than objective and it gets sometimes crazy. So if you're an allegoricalist on this iron ax head swimming story, the way they allegorize it is that the ax head represents man's soul. Do you see it? So this represents man's soul. And the Jordan River represents judgment. So the ax head lands in the, in the Jordan. So your soul ultimately will be judged. Now, is that true? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a true statement. Is that what the passage is teaching? Hardly. But that's how you would allegorize it. And so man's soul is hopelessly lost beneath the waters of judgment. The stick, of course, that, that the prophet will use, uh, that branch of wood represents what? <laughs> the cross. The cross. That branch represents the cross. And when the cross of Jesus enters the situation, man's soul that's been sunk can be resurrected and rescued. But for that to be accomplished, you need to take hold of the Lord by faith. So reach out and take this by faith. So that's the allegorical view of this. Is that convincing? Hardly, hardly. Misses the whole heart of the message. There's an application from this message that should leave us today very encouraged. Allegorizing can be a very dangerous hermeneutic when the passage is not an allegory. So let me just illustrate this in a ridiculous way, because I like to interpret the Bible literally, and that includes the metaphors and similes, and if it's an allegory, to do it allegorically. Let's say your wife, man, has asked you to go to the store and pick things up. So she tells you the list, and, um, and you don't need to write it down. Why don't you need to write it down? Because you're a man. And you will remember everything on the list. You know that. So ladies, when he comes home and you're looking for the bag he puts on the counter and you're looking for a per particular thing on the list and it's not there, right? It's just not there. Oops, sorry, I forgot that one, right? So guys, you get a list. So she gets a, gives you a list. And on that list, she's written down one, the first item, noodles. Noodles. So let's allegorize this. You're a man. You're... Rather just picking up noodles, he says, you know what? She probably means like, use your noodle, use your noodle. So you go buy the vegetables and you pick up a head of lettuce because you're using your noodle, your head. So you don't buy noodles, you buy a head of lettuce and you cross off noodles on the list, right? That's the allegorical approach. Uh, in addition to the list, on the list is marshmallows. Marshmallows are soft. So you think she wants something soft. So you get a four pack of Charmin, Charmin. And you throw the toilet paper into the, into the cart and you cross off marshmallows. You've allegorized, okay. Next on the list is chicken. He recalls that sometimes we call people chicken. And if they seem to lack courage, we might call them yellow. <laughs> and so immediately with this clue, he picks up a package of yellow mustard and puts it in the, in the cart and crosses off chicken. And he's completed his shopping and he comes home and she just wanted noodles and chicken and marshmallows. And you know what he came home with. So is she upset? No, she's not upset because he said, I'm so sorry, I'm, I, this is not what you want. And she says, not at all. He says, why don't I just take you out to dinner? And she says, that's what I wanted all along. <laughs> and they lived happily ever after, right? What a great allegory. Doesn't that warm your soul? You know, so the allegorical approach to scripture can be absolutely ridiculous. In the early second century of the church, a uh, famous preacher, Origen, just, just symbolized, allegorized entire stories of the Bible. And it was quite captivating. People like to hear the allegories. Just led man sadly away from the truths of, of the word of God. So this story about the lost ax head uh, that the seminary student borrowed, is it a message about debt? 
This tells you you shouldn't get in debt because this guy lost something borrowed and now he couldn't repay it. This is a moral message about debt. I don't think that's the message. Maybe it's a proverb, a wise man does not cut wood near a river. You know, it's a proverb. You know, I don't think it's a proverb. It's not an allegory. It's, it's not a moral lesson here. Uh, the unbeliever says, you know, it, it never floated. This, this iron axe head could never float. What happened is, is, is Elijah got a piece of a stick he cut off and dragged it to the side and he just picked it up out of the water, right? So unbelief says, it didn't float, it didn't swim. Axe heads don't swim. So let's look at the story. We're going to interpret literally, that's the only thing I can do. And let's take home the application of, of first the axe head this morning. So let's begin. Uh, there's a need, there's a need. And uh, there's the need of a building. That's a good problem. Uh, the seminary was growing. Uh, there was an increase of preachers and prophets. So that's, that's, that's a good trend. The, the nation is struggling, but at least there's some men of God that are in the process of being trained. Uh, I shared with our staff this week that when I was a seminary student, we had 1,000 seminary students in my class. 1,000 preachers, 1,000 preachers. And to get together and sing souls for Jesus is our battle cry, wow, that was exciting. They have 1,000 preacher boys. Today in our circles, there are less than 1,000 preachers in training in all of our schools combined. So the trend's not good. The trend's not good. You know, we're often looking to fill staff positions it's almost to a point saying, I'm not sure if we need to even look because there's not much on the shelf. And perhaps the Lord wants us to look more within anyway to train up people to do the work of the ministry. In this case, there was a need. Look at the text, verse one. The sons of the prophet said unto Elijah, behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. It's just too small, not enough room, it's too tight. We're, we've grown beyond its borders, its walls. Good problem. Maybe you're facing a problem like this where you need a bigger house. Maybe your company is growing in a, in a crazy time like this. Wow, if your company's growing, that's amazing. That's amazing, but perhaps it is. Perhaps it is. You need more space. You need a project that, to make something in, to enlarge it. And you're wondering, should I do it? Can I do it? How will we do it? They're in a situation here where they needed to build. There is a need. In verse 2, they're looking at the location. It's always location, location, location. You can't beat this location right on a river. That's pretty. That's pretty. Uh, in church history, there was a little college that was built on the Neshaminy River in Pennsylvania. Uh, the tenants, Mr. Tennant had kids that he wanted to train to be workers of the Lord. And so he built a little college, um, maybe the size of where the pianos are. They made it out of logs. It was called the Little Log College. And all the family worked together and they all built it together by the river, by the river. Eventually it was moved over to New Jersey. I've seen a replica of it in New Jersey. And then it was moved up a little north from that location. Today it's called Princeton, Princeton. It's originally a very conservative Bible-centered college, a Little Log College right by the river. Let us go, we pray thee. Uh, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And the prophet said, I go, I'm forcefully behind this. I'm, I, I think it's a great idea. Build it. And I, I love that little phrase, every man a beam. That's how every building project and how the work of God should go forward. Every man a beam, every person a ministry, every, every one of us have a niche of work to do. Uh, maybe not equal sacrifice, but equal giving, but equal sacrifice. We can all work. We can all do something. Every man a beam. And so um, there's a, the need of a building. They have the location. And uh, everyone just shouldered the work. And I, I love that. Uh, it's neat to see churches work together. Yesterday, watching the funeral and the reception, watching people work together, just filling in areas and spots, picking up tables, setting up this. Need to watch, need to see a, a church family love each other, work together. That's what, it's, what it should be like. So there's a location of the building, every man a beam. And of course, uh, as you go forward in a building program, whether it's personal or for a church or for your business, 
you know, the, the most important thing in the process, is this the will of God? Do we have, the, do we have God signing off on this? Uh, is God approving the building? And one said to the prophet, you know, basically be content. He's saying, you know, be engaged, be committed. I pray thee and go with us. And the, the man of God, Elijah, representing in many ways the Lord in this project, said, I will go. You've got my, you've got my blessing. You've got my support. You've got my participation. I'll go with you. We'll do this together. Uh, the project is approved. And so uh, that's always good to have God in it. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Psalm 127, verse 1. So if you're looking to do whatever for the Lord, the most important thing is, is this the will of God? Is it the timing of God? And if you can nail that down, if you're going to do God's work then, God's way, I believe you'll never lack God's supply. God will provide. If you know it's the will of God. So how do you get to know if it's the will of God? You got to get alone with the Lord. You pray, you seek the Lord. You're in the word of God. You get counsel from men and women of God. And, and you're seeking, is this your will? And if you can nail that down, just step out on the promises of God and watch him provide. And uh, this small group of men are going to see the, the really the, the miraculous hand of God at work. So they begin the building. It's an exciting project. And they're, they're cutting down wood. You know, I love cutting down wood. If anyone's been to our cabin, we have more wood. We have probably have enough firewood for probably 10, 15, 20 years. It'll probably rot before we use it. Um, I love cutting wood. I love splitting wood. If my mother's listening to the message, she's saying, listen to the preacher. That's not true. <laughs> She'll say, we've always burned wood. Why weren't you so energetic about splitting and cutting wood when you were a teenager? Okay, mom, you're right. I didn't like it then, but I love it, love it now. It's a great workout, you know. They're cutting down the wood. What man here doesn't want to have a project like this? What man hasn't thought of building a cabin out of logs? Even right now, I'm thinking of cutting down pine trees and building a log cabin. Right now, I'm thinking of it. I've watched YouTubes on how to do it. I'm, I'm serious about this. I'd like to build a cabin of logs. How many of you guys, you, know, you, you would say, yeah, I've had that you know, inspiration, or I've thought of that too. How many guys like that? This is awesome. I got workers. This is wonderful. You can help me. <laughs> you can satisfy your dreams, you know. So they're building this thing. And uh, as you look at verse five, it kind of shares a little bit of the insight as to the financial condition of probably all these seminary students. So as one was cutting down a beam, the axe head fell into the water. So you think about this for a moment, you know, thank the Lord when that ax came off the handle that it didn't hit someone. Have you ever been on a building site? It's a dangerous place. Uh, how many of you have been hit with a, a nail gun? Anyone hit, get hit by a nail gun? At least Debbie, I know Debbie, our secretary. Yeah, I mean, nail guns, that's scary. When you're out working on a building project and nails are flying by, they're like bullets. They can kill you, actually. They can do a lot of damage. So uh, fortunately, no one was hurt, no one was killed, but that axe head goes out into the Jordan River, and this poor student cries and says, alas, master, he's speaking to Elijah, he says, you know, I lost his head it was, it, before it was borrowed. I'm saying, wow, this guy doesn't even have enough money to, you know, buy an axe head, or probably to replace it. And he's, he's, he's tore up over the loss of an axe head. Now, you and I have a lot of problems probably right now. And if not, we will tomorrow. It's probably not as small as losing an axe head, okay? You're talking about maybe losing your house. <laughs> You're talking about maybe losing your job. You're talking about maybe losing, you know, your, your credit history. So this is serious. This guy's lost it. And um, it was borrowed. Now, who did he borrow it from? I have no idea. But I do know this. If men live by their tools and you borrow one of their tools and do not return it you've committed a cardinal sin okay so how many of you men work with it by physical tools i mean you how many of you men your livelihoods by tools i know it is you know my tools are books so if i lend out a book and not get a book back that's an unpardonable sin okay if you borrow all someone's tools that he needs at the job site and it's not there and you didn't return it, you know, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So who knows who, whose axe head this was? 
but he's obviously very discouraged by the loss of it. This is an obstacle. The building project for him at least has come to a screaming halt until he gets that access. Now the, the Jordan River is not real deep. It's not even real wide. You know, it might be five foot, it might be eight foot, it might be 10 foot, depending on where it was. Um, for Marion, we were in the Jordan. I think it was four feet deep, three feet deep where we were. What a privilege to, to baptize Marion in the Jordan River, in the Jordan River. What a, what a blessing, you know. It was kind of a little eerie for me because I had these long, these big fish were swimming between my legs. <laughs> you probably didn't even know. There's just fish everywhere. And I told folks yesterday at the funeral how much I love fish. I just don't like fish, you know, going all slimy around my legs. I don't like that. But here, that, that axe head's in that river. How deep? I don't know. It's not a very pretty river. It's pretty brown. You don't see the bottom of it. It's dirty. It's dirty. It's not like those Syrian rivers. So um, probably a little deeper there. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? So the man of God then says, uh, you know, where did it fall? About where did it land in the water? And the, 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 the preacher in training went, goes over, right about there. I, I, I borrowed this thing, and I'm just so, I'm so worked up. So Elijah cuts down a stick from a tree there, a branch, and the location there in the water, he, he casts out the branch and lets it land near where that ripple would have been, where the axe had landed and went to the bottom. And sure enough, as he cut down a stick and cast it there, the iron did swim. So I'm just going to interpret that literally. The iron head came off the, the bottom of that Jordan River. It rose, and now it's doing the backstroke on the water. On the water. It's floating is the idea. Now, that's, that's violating at least two laws of science, the law of gravity and the law of magnetic attraction. A wooden stick does not magnetically have the power to lift a piece of iron. So what is being described here is something supernatural, something God had to do. Elijah didn't have this power, but he had a God who did. And Elijah had a walk with God where he sensed that God was going to do something incredibly encouraging for that young man. You know, the axe head swimming, that's pretty big. When you think about that man's ministry for the rest of his life, do you think he'll ever forget the day the axe head swum? Don't you think he'll go back to that into his mind many a time saying, wow, I saw God by his grace raise just a little thing like this, a little problem, just a borrowed lost axe head, and he brought it to the surface and I was able to retrieve it and continue my work for God. Sure, he's going to remember this the rest of his life. It's a real, real, real source, uh, indeed, of encouragement. Small thing, but to him it was a big thing. And God took notice. Isn't it great that God takes notice of the big things as well as the little things? Right now there's a big thing, this Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's a big thing. And is God involved and interested in that? Is he doing things? I'm sure he is. Well, what about you? You've lost your wallet. You've lost your keys. You've lost your cell phone, your remote control to your stupid TV, whatever it may be. That You're worked up over some small little thing. Is God interested in that little thing in your life? He is interested in the big things, and he's interested in little things. He's not a CEO God that just does the big things for people. He does even the little things. And we're thankful that he cares for us in every detail uh, of our lives. I think of the former prime minister of Great Britain, William Gladstone. Wow, interesting individual. Uh, during his administration, um, there was a, a street cleaner right outside the building that would be there every day cleaning the streets uh, to, the, to the parliament building. There also uh, was a worker that knew the Lord, a Christian worker that often tried to give out the gospel there. It was a strategic place for ministry. And uh, that, that street cleaner would come out every day, and the, the, the Christian guy would always say hi to him. They always just were very cordial, and they did it every day. And on one occasion, the Christian worker was there, and the street cleaner wasn't. And uh, he thought, well, that's odd. He's always here. Maybe he's sick today. And he would just waited to the next day and the next day. And sure enough, after a few days, he never, that guy never came back. So the Christian worker said, I need to find out what's going on here. And he talked to some folks there on the street, other street cleaners, and 
found out the guy where he lived and went to the guy's house. And once he went in, he found out the guy was very, very, very sick. Very, very, very sick. And uh, the Christian guy said, look, I just want you to know, I, I was just thinking of you. I've, you must be pretty lonely. And he said, no, not really. And the Christian guy said, well, why have you been lonely? He said, well, uh, the prime minister has been here each day reading to me the Bible. And the Christian worker said, you're talking about William Gladstone, our prime minister? He said, yeah. And that Christian worker just thought to himself, he said, that prime minister probably had other things on his to-do list each day, but he had enough concern for his citizens that he came to the side of a street cleaner to just be an encouragement to him and actually read the Bible to him and pray. That's a man. How much more so does God, the king of the universe, care for all of his citizens when it comes to the biggest of things and the most influential of people to the least? And we have such a God like that. Now, let me tell you the story of the axe head. Then we'll look at the second paragraph here. For each of us, the question is asked, do we need to find our axe head floating? Do you feel sunk right now? <laughs> is something lost, something missing? Do you need a miracle? Do you need your axe head to float? Or someone else's axe head you borrowed to float? So I'll share the story of the axe head. We were living in Clemson at the time, and uh, we had outgrown our house. It was too straight using a 2 Kings 6 passage. Um, it was a nice house, but if, to expand ministry and with our expanding family and some of our interests in foster care of other kids, we felt we needed more space. We looked for homes. Oh, we look. We have our guidelines for size, location, so on, price, and we never could find anything that really fit our budget. And so we had this crazy idea to build a house, to build a house. And if anyone knows about my building abilities, you would say, Pastor, you stick to your day job. That's not a good idea. Believe me, you would say that as a friend. You know, I, I can't even cut a two by four in a square fashion, okay? I remember cutting a two by four using an old steel chainsaw or circular saw. And I put the piece of wood two by four over the washer and the new dryer. And there was a little gap in between. So I, I could cut that board. It was kind of my saw horse, the washer dryer. And as I went through that piece of wood, I had my little line on the top and was following the line, sparks were firing up everywhere. And I thought, maybe there's a nail in that wood. I thought it was a brand new piece of wood. Well, no, it wasn't a piece, of, uh, it wasn't a nail in the wood. I was sawing through the dryer. I don't know how I got that far off. There was a pretty good sized crack between the washer and dryer to cut my line. But I, 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 I put a line through the new washing machine or dry, was it the dryer washing machine? Brand new, actually. And I felt bad afterwards. You know, that's how bad I am. I asked a, a contractor in our church there at the time, you know, to build, what do I do? He says, well, you got to do this. You got to have a footer. And I said, um, I asked him, I said, what is a footer? So that's how we started. So I'm going to be the contractor, the architect, and my family's going to be the Sherpas. We're going, to do, we're going to build a house. We're going to save money because, you know, general contractors are just ripping you off anyway. They're, they're not worth a dollar, okay? So they're a pretty useless profession, and I can do anything a general contractor can do and save all this money, right? This is foolishness. If you're a general contractor, you earn every penny in your line of work. So uh, we, we bought a piece of property, 1.1 acres, killer deal, $7,000, paid it out. We then had in our pocket $2,000 to build a house. That's how we built a house. We're going to build it. You can save a lot of money, this one. A lot of money. This one. So we had $2,000. We had no debt. We had the land. And I remember going out to the land. I, I bought each of my kids an axe, an axe. And we're going to clear the property, 1.1 acres of southern jungle with their axes. And we did that for weeks. We actually did it for months. <clears throat> we would eventually get a, a bulldozer in, and they did it in a half a day <laughs> and cleared out the area. And I remember looking at that opening. We were going to do a walkout basement. It was going to be a two-story house. I designed it. It was 40 by 32, two stories. 
And I remember walking out there and saying, Lord, I don't think it's big enough. I don't think it's big enough. And that morning, I had read 2 Kings 6. 2 Kings 6. For my devotions. I said, Lord, can that axe head swim bigger than that? <laughs> can the axe head swim? And there's another passage that came to my mind, Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, let it be unto you. According to your faith, let it be unto you. Lord, do I go from, from the 40 by 32 to 48 by 32 and go three stories? Just a slight change. It wouldn't be a lot of more money. It couldn't be. Three stories from two? Peanuts, peanuts. I got $2,000. So I, I went out into the woods to pray. And it, next to the lot is a little dirt road that we went back to an old plantation that was no longer there. It was ruined. It was destroyed. It was no, nothing back there except the old oak trees. And this little road would go back to it. And on each side of that dirt road is a swamp. So you go back and you hear things dropping off the branches into the swamp and they slither away. They're called water moccasins. Water moccasins. So going through moccasin swamp, I went back to where the old ha farmhouse was. And Jim, man, he was always digging back there, always digging back there. By the old oak tree, by the old farm, he dug up uh, either a bag or a box. And in that box was silver, a lot of silver, silver spoons and knives and forks. He would take it to a silver dealer uh, in Pendleton and say, can you tell me about this silver? And I said, oh, this is really good silver. And there's dates on it, 1851, 1852. Why is that significant? Because in 1861, the Yankees were there and not New York Yankees, not even Boston Red Sox. What had happened if you were a Southern plantation owner and the Yankees were coming down to your plantations and a guy by the name of Sherman was, 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 was burning down your, your ranches and your, your, your plantations, you would take your silver and your valuables and you'd get them out of the house. And in some cases you'd bury them. Obviously this family buried their silver and either forgot where they had buried it or, or was removed from the premises. Jim found the silver. And right by that old oak tree, as I was walking, Lord, do I build this house? I found this. I just had my devotions on 2 Kings 6 with the axe head swimming. Now, there was no handle. It probably was a handle. Maybe it was leaned against the tree. I don't know. You don't know the story. But there by that tree was this axe head. And I came back to the house and I'm saying, Lord, in my mind, it couldn't be any more obvious. We're going big. We're going big. We're going to trust the Lord to allow the axe head to swim. We're going to trust God to do the miraculous. We're going to trust God to, do, to, to provide, whether it's something small or something big, as in this case, in building a house. And we went forward, and we built, by the grace of God, the 48 by 32 three-story house. And we saw the axe head swim. We were in the same process praying about building an auditorium at that time in Clemson. And sure enough, we were praying, and I found another axe head on a battleground, a battlefield, a southern battlefield. <laughs> you know, someone had overlooked it for probably over 100, you know, whatever, 30 years. Another axe head. I said, Lord, we're going forward. We're going to build because you can make the axe head swim. When we came here on March 16th, we came here a little earlier than that, but on March 16th, 2003, I brought the axe head out. Some of you were here. I was preaching in the gym at the time. I said, said to the folks, I'm going to turn to 2 Kings 6. And I preached 2 Kings 6. And I said, folks, we're going to trust God to see the axe head swim. And we presented to the church on that Sunday a plan to trust God to help us pay off some very large debts. What did the Lord do? He caused the axe head to swim. Involved in that presentation was for the debts to be removed and, and this beautiful auditorium to be built. And by the grace of God, truly, by God's grace, the axe head swam. And I want to encourage you, 
you know, there's a beautiful picture of one of our daughter-in-laws. I think Becca is just, you know, she's a princess. I tell you, to, to do the, her wedding, our son Ben's wedding at our former church, knowing that God built that church by grace and by faith, and that God caused the axe head to swim, very rewarding, very rewarding. To be here this morning, I never lose the wonder of it all. I come in here and say, wow, it's just a building because the church is people, but boy, what a, a beautiful setting. Lord, you allowed the axe head to swim. So whatever you are facing, whether it's simply an axe head that you borrowed that you lost, I think that you can get one for about $19.95, a good one at, at Home Depot if you want. My son can make you one if you'd like. Uh, Tony Kingry can make one in a heartbeat. How many axe heads? I mean, he built an axe head this afternoon of the finest steel. So if it's an axe head that you need, God can provide it and he can cause it to swim. If it is a house or something very large and you're saying, like, there's no way it's going to happen, God can make the axe head swim. May I encourage you this morning, God is in that business to raise the exit. So trust him, trust him. Now, secondly, this morning, we'll just breeze through this, a beautiful story. There's a, three stories in the chapter. The third story really ties into the next chapter. So I'll keep that all together. So just a couple of verses into the, into the next unit. And boy, there's structure everywhere. I will not bore you today as I you normally do with structure. I'll leave that out. You can get the slide and figure out what that is. But let's talk about the next part. This is awesome. Because not only can God provide, we saw that with the axe head, but secondly, in this chapter, God can, can protect. God can protect. You know, if you've got kids, you're praying all the time, Lord, protect them. You've got grandkids, you're praying, Lord, protect them. You know, for us in, in Clemson, we had, we had the Eastern Diamondback, the rattlesnake. We had on our property multiple times the, the copperhead. And right behind us, I mentioned the swamp, we had the, the cotton mouth of the water moccasin. Also in that state is the coral snake. It's more near the coastline. And uh, to, to see those copperheads in the spring give birth to a bunch of little baby copperheads where you have maybe 12, 15, 18, 20, 30 little copperhead snakes all doing their thing around your feet. And they're just as lethal, if not more so at that stage than they are as an adult. And your kids are always out there playing and digging. You pray every day. You pray. Who doesn't pray for protection for their kids? We should be praying for protection for those in Ukraine. We should be praying for protection for our country. Is God able to protect? Well, let's look at these. Look at the points on protection. Verse 8, then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants saying, in such and such a place shall be my camp. So here's this arrogant king who's basically saying, we're going to have our way with Israel. We're going to set up camp here. We're going to use that as our, our, our beachhead, and we're going to attack Israel from there, and we'll be, we'll be triumphant. So what we're going to see in this story is the supernatural protection of God. Look at verse 9 as the story begins to unfold. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel saying, beware. I warn you, let me, let me give you some inside information. Beware that thou pass not such a place, for there the Syrians are come down. So here's the man of God, Elijah, saying to the king, probably Jehoram, the Assyrian king is probably Ben-Hadad II. The time period is 845 BC. And so what we have here is, is the prophet saying, king, if I can just give you some heads up, you don't want to go down that road. You don't want to lead your troops in that direction. You don't want to be found there because there's an ambush being set up. And so what's happening here, Lord's going to protect, and sometimes he uses humans as his agents to protect us. I have three sons. They're still living, praise God, that they are. And it's because God used a human agent. It's called a mother, a mother. So praise God for the human agents that God uses to protect people. So the Lord uses that. He's using Elijah. Look at, first, look at the first 10. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. The impression is, is that the king of Syria is constantly scheming, strategizing, trying to get Zelensky, whatever the name is, and going after him, trying to assassinate, trying to take this guy out. And every time he makes a move or a change in his, his strategy to, to, to really surround uh, Jehoram, Jehoram's tipped off by the preacher every time. 
So there's a chess game going, and, and you can, he can he the uh, pagan king can never get to the get never get to the king never get to the king. There's never a checkmate. So verse eleven, guess what happens? This happens over and over and over again. And so guess what happens? The heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. I mean, this is getting more than coincidental. This is getting ridiculous. And he's thinking, there's no way that that king of Israel can know every move I make unless there's a spy here. And of course, if you have spies in your midst, all you have to do is ask him, who's the spy? And they always volunteer and tell you, you know. We do that here. If you're a Russian spy, please tell us, because that's not good. And they're going to tell you. They'll tell you. They're just the way they are, the way spies work. And he called his servants and said to them, will, not, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Who's here on the other team? And they're saying, we're all for you, king. We don't understand it either. What's amazing about God's protective measures for his people, that even the unbeliever in due time <laughs> realizes that there's another power involved and at work where they have to acknowledge that this is more than coincidental. This is providential. This is, this is God protecting his people. That God is orchestrating the steps. That God is doing these timing things. They're just spectacular. Uh, the other night we had a, it wasn't funny at the time. It's somewhat humorous now. We were grumpy actually when it happened. Maybe even snarky, if that's a word. So we went out to dinner on, on Friday to where all the old people go. They don't let anyone under 60 eat there. I think it's an awesome restaurant. And um, you have to be 60 or above to eat at the Black Eyed Pea. Okay, you got to be 60 or above. So we go there. We're in that category. You get a free drink of your meal. You know, it's what, how old people think, right? You, we know all the deals in town, right? If you're an old person, 60 or above, you know where you get the free drinks. So I got a lemonade. She got a root beer. And we had a nice dinner. We came out afterwards. I did not bring my phone, neither did she. We always bring our phones. But we're just going to eat at home and have other things to do at home. We came out, and uh, our car would not start. It's a new car. It's in 2018. That's pretty new to me. Wouldn't start. Lights kind of flickering on and off, kind of weird. And um, it didn't work. It's getting late, eight, nearing 8 o'clock. You know, we're trying to figure this stupid thing out. And... Um, so we went to the mattress store next door to Black Eyed Pea, and Matt, the mattress guy, I like that, Matt, the mattress guy, um, was so kind. You could use, he said, you can use my phone. I said, that'd be great. But I don't know a single phone number. I know my number, and my wife is with me. I said, I only know one other number, but I'll call it. And I, could, I did. I called the church. I couldn't believe it. Debbie, you were not here. It was 740. Heather, what are you thinking? When I needed you, there was no one here, 740. Said, That's the only number I know. You know how it works. Siri, call <laughs> Bubba Smith. You don't, you don't know a number, so don't laugh at me. You don't know a number either. I don't know who to call. I don't have a number. So um, the short of it, we walked home, or we tried to go home. Went that far. Nothing to feel sorry about. It was a really romantic walk because she walked ahead of me the entire time. Because she was scared. She was scared. The big city of Westminster. She was scared. So uh, we, we ended up going to the prices and uh, on the route. And Gary's so gifted at fixing things, I thought he'd be perfect. And so he came and tried to work on it. And it wouldn't start. Wouldn't start. He suggested, do you have a warranty for this? I said, you know, I think I do. I pay a lot of money. That lady at, at the Honda door, store wanted me to buy this ridiculous platinum thing for, you know, 2000 a month, whatever it was. And and she gave me the deal afterwards. She kept, that price just kept coming down and down. That's amazing to, to play in that deal. And I, so I, I know I'm paying a lot of extra money every month for something, whatever it is. And so uh, there was a number, roadside assistance. And sure enough, I've been paying for, for months for that. What a deal, you know. So I called and I talked to this lady, I think George in New Delhi, um, India. She spoke Indian. That's supposed to be funny. There's not a language Indian. <laughs> I think she was in Arizona. She was very sweet. And she said, I'll get you, I'll get you a tow truck driver there in immediate, immediately, immediately. And so she, she said, he will text you. As soon as I hang up, you'll get a text. 
So I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. I do get the text. The guy's coming. Yes, yes. I, and I told the lady, I have a funeral tomorrow at 11. Do you think you'll be here by then? She said, I'm so sorry for your loss, <laughs> Debbie. So sorry for your loss. So um, I get another message. He's not coming. Another guy's going to come instead. Another guy's going to come. So I wait and wait and wait. And finally, that guy calls me, calls me from the Black Eyed Pea. Well, I'm parked in the Black Eyed Pea. He's at the other Black Eyed Pea up on I-25. I said, sir, didn't you read the directions? No, no, I know where you are. No, you don't. I'm at the other Black Eyed Pea. Okay, I'll be right there. He comes. This is the point now. Here's the point. God allowed that little Honda to die for a purpose. And we, we talked about it. We knew when these things happen, your mind has to start being conditioned to think, okay, we have a problem. Who does the Lord have in mind in this trial for us to witness to? You have to think that way. And I'm not saying I'm real spiritual, but that's where we usually get to, okay, Lord, this is not what we want. Who, in, in, who are you organ, orchestrating for us to meet to witness to? When that guy showed up really late, I knew he was the guy. He, 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 he cussed worse than a sailor. How many sailors do we have? I'm sorry, it's really a horrible thing to say. He, he had a very limited vocabulary, and, the, and most of the words were bad. And he was telling me that his meeting with me that night was karma. And I didn't say anything. I just listened to his karma presentation, because I'm going to give him my presentation equal time. And he's just cussing, cussing away. He gets the car to start. I'm in my truck. I'm alone. He says, I'll just tow your car home. I said, that'd be great. That'd be great. So we get to our house. I said, can I just talk to you for a moment? And he says, yeah, sure. I said, Cameron, tonight was not karma. Tonight was a divine appointment by God himself. And God wanted me to meet you tonight. Not that I'm anyone special, but God wanted me to talk with you tonight. Can I share with you how to be a Christian? He turns his truck off, talk to me. We talk for about a half hour, a half hour, wide open, wide open. Cameron, can we follow up on this conversation? He pulls out a big cross. He says, I really am a Christian. He says, well, that's great. Can we, let's, let's follow up on this. He said, I can't believe we had this talk tonight. He's, he basically said, it appears that God did want this meeting. It wasn't karma. He said, today, I was at a funeral for a fellow tow truck driver. He said that guy had just been shot here in Denver three weeks ago. His fellow tow truck driver was called by a company to come and remove a car. It was illegally parked overnight. Tow truck driver just did his thing, took the car, took it to you, dropped the cars off. The owner of the car later the next day, where's my car? Finds out it's been towed to that location, goes, he has to pay $300 to get that tow paid and that fee paid. It's a 17 year old kid, he hits the roof. And he tells the people there at that, that holding place for his car, he says, who is the tow truck company? Well, you have to pay them. He says, I'm going to come after that tow truck driver. And that 17-year-old kid with two of his buddies found out where that tow truck driver worked and lived and set up an ambush. And when that tow truck driver took off, that kid put eight bullets through the tow truck and one for the head of the driver. And that guy, Cameron, as I talked to him Friday night, he said, all I can think of is death. I think of my friend. I was just at his funeral, and this meeting here, in essence, was a divine appointment. I needed this. When God protects and God orchestrates and God's leading, well, even the unbeliever says, wow, someone's, someone's orchestrating this. Someone's doing this. This is not coincidental. It's not karma. There's a divine mind and heart behind it. Very, very powerful. So sure enough, what we have here, and one of his servants said, oh, none, my lord, O king, but Elijah the prophet that's in Israel tells the king, he knows what you're saying in your bedroom. You got to be careful even what you say, king, because there's a prophet that knows your every move somehow. Maybe it's his God. And so the king says, oh, who is this guy? Elijah, huh? Where can we find Elijah? He lives in Dotham. He lives in Dotham. That's not Gotham. <laughs> that's Dotham. And sure enough, the king of Syria says, this game's going to end. I'm done with this. This guy is going to go. What a mistake to go after the man of God. What a fool. But sure enough, verse 14, what does this Syrian king do? He sends his horses, his chariots, his army, a great army, 
And by stealth, they come to Dothan by night and they surround the city. Can you see it? <laughs> if you can't, uh, look through the eyes of the servant of the man, Elijah, because the servant sees it. The servant of the man of God was risen early and he goes out, goes outside, gone forth. And behold, a host compassed the city, both of horses and chariots. Can you imagine? That's pretty, in that's pretty intimidating. Have you ever been surrounded by a hostile enemy? You know, Jim tells the story of, of a time with his group in Afghanistan. We're brought into an ambush. He says, it's always really strange, Dad, when the streets, there's no one on the streets, when the doors are shut and it's really quiet. He says, you know something's up because the people know something's up. And his, uh, his friends walked through a huge propane tank, huge tank. And the enemy blew that tank up and sent shrapnel in every direction, took out a number of our guys number of our guys and they knew it they knew something was coming down they knew that the enemy was around them but they couldn't see him in this case the enemy surrounds the city they could see him so he goes inside and says master how should we do what are we going to do what are we going to do there's no hope we're surrounded god can't do anything with this it's too big it's a big problem and i love what elijah says and he answered him he says look fear not i love this fear not fear not there's a lesson here God wants us all to learn. The Lord wants us to learn the lesson of his unseen protection. God is protecting you whether you see it or not. You can trust that because that he is a provider and a protector. That's the nature of God. He doesn't want us to live by fear. He wants us to live by faith. And he says, stop being afraid. And he says to his servant Gehazi, for they that be with us, are more than they that be with them. So here are two men in a small house in Dauphin, surrounded by however many thousands of people who are just going to destroy them. And Elijah says, you know, there's more of us here than out there. And you're just saying, man, oh man. How do you come with that conclusion? And, and I love what Elijah does. He prays and he says, Lord, Elijah knows there's an unseen host around him. But Elijah says, Lord, can you help my servant? I pray thee, open his eyes. Open his eyes that he may, may see what I believe, what I don't have to see, but I believe we are surrounded by an unseen host. And the Lord opened very graciously the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. Isn't that powerful? So here you are, you and I, who knows the situations we face, but is it safe to say that the same God has the same host that has our back? And we think we're a minority, but in reality, we are with God a majority at all times, in all places. God has our back, whether we see it or not, because that's the nature of God. So how's the story end? It ends really neat, it really neat. You have an enemy there, hostile, that's gonna kill the prophet. That's their mindset. And, and go beyond that to kill Israel, kill Jews. This is a mini Holocaust attempt. So when they came down to him, Elijah prayed in the Lord, verse 18, and said, smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. You know, my servant couldn't see, open his eyes so he can see, now just the opposite cause those who see, do not see. And they are blinded according to the word of Elijah. And Elijah said unto those hostile soldiers who are now confused and blind, he says, follow me. And I'm going to lead you to where uh, you need to go. And he leads them 10 miles from Dothan to Samaria, to King Jehoram, the guy that they ultimately like, would like to do a checkmate with. And so sure enough, they bring, him to, bring these, these troops to Samaria. And when they got there, he said to the Lord, Lord, open their eyes now. Eyes are opened. To their surprise, they are now the ones surrounded by King Jehoram and his troops. And they realize their life is about to end. What a scary situation for them. So the king of Israel said to Elijah, okay, what do we, I see them. You know, what, should we kill them? Is that the plan? Should we smite them now? And watch what Elijah does here with the enemies. 
And this reflects too on the nature of God. Even though these enemies would have killed Jehoram if they could, they would have killed Elijah if they could. Look at the gracious response. He says, don't smite them. Rather than butchering them, let's have a banquet. Don't, 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 don't smite, smite those whom you've taken captive with your sword, with your bow. Set bread instead and water before them. Let them eat and drink. Then send them back to their, to their leader. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? You have them in your hands, in your grasp. You could kill them. These are evil people. That's, I think, very obvious. I think God is showing his love for the world, even for the enemies of Israel in this case. And I think that's going to lead to some changes. And the change is seen here in this last verse, verse 23. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. The result being the bands of Syria came no more. They're, they don't do these raids anymore. There was a change. There was repentance. They didn't come after Elijah anymore. They didn't come after the king anymore. <laughs> they learned some lessons. They learned some lessons. They didn't repeat them. And they didn't return. And the reason being is they saw that there was a God of, of Israel who provided for his people and protected his people. And they realized that there was a, a, a shield there that they could not penetrate. They were wise finally to say, I, I, I'm not going to go any further with this. I'm not going to fight them. It's useless. They've got a great God behind them. So they don't write again. Isn't that beautiful? So for us today, as we close, whatever you need, truly need, Jesus is the I am. Fill it in. Whatever you need. I am, you fill it in. He is that to you. He'll meet your need. The axe head will swim if you trust him. If his protection and you're in a vulnerable spot right now, trust him. Uh, there's an unseen host protecting you. Trust God to protect you. What a great shepherd. Trust him for provision. Trust him for protection. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these uh, passages. I would imagine for the exiled Jews in Babylon who are the first recipients of these stories. This must have been very encouraging to people who had lost everything where their lives, they were really sunk. And to see the axe head swim, what an encouragement to them when they were so low and when they had been so defeated and so beat up because of their sin to realize that there is a God who protects those who are faithful to him. Lord, this morning, you know our church family, you know those on, on Zoom that are listening, you know those who need a miracle of provision where the axe head needs to swim, and maybe it needs to swim this week, that you would provide for them even supernaturally, meet their needs, show your might for your glory. Lord, for protection, protect us as your children. We know we are going to be more and more the targets of the evil ones. Lord, help us to put on the shield, the right protection. Help us to do what you've told us to do, but ultimately, Lord, we trust you to guard us, to protect us, to keep us. So, Lord, protect our people here. Provide for our people for your great name's sake, for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Pastor Larry will lead us in a closing hymn. Thank you for joining us. Please drive carefully home. Lord bless you. Number 385, let's sing the first two stanzas together. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, trust and obey. Let's sing that together. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey not a shadow can rise not a cloud in the skies but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign nor a fear can abide if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's
there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.